Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Ingrid Alvarez, and I am the Vice President for Public Policy and Strategic Engagement at Hispanic Federation. It is my great pleasure to partner with the Brennan Center for Justice uh, and bring to you uh, Drawing the Line, How Redistricting Impacts Latino Communities in Texas. Uh, welcome to our audience, and thank you for joining us for this very important conversation today. Hispanic Federation has a strong commitment to language justice and therefore making it accessible in English with simultaneous interpretation into Spanish. You will be able to both listen and ask questions in the language you feel most powerful in. Buenas tardes y gracias por su asistencia. La Federación Hispana tiene un gran compromiso con la justicia lingüística Y por lo tanto, el mismo será accesible en inglés con interpretación simultánea en español. Usted podrá tanto escuchar como hacer preguntas en el idioma en que se sienta con más poder. To access the interpretation feature, click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen, select the language you prefer, Select mute original audio and click done. If you're on a mobile phone or tablet, click the three dots that say more, then select the language interpretation option and follow the steps previously mentioned. Para acceder la herramienta de inter interpretación, haga clic en el icono del globo en la parte de abajo de su pantalla. Seleccione el idioma de su preferencia, silenciar el audio original y listo. Si se está conectando a través de un teléfono móvil o una tableta, haga clic en los tres puntos que dicen más, seleccione interpretación de idiomas, y sigas los pasos men mencionados previamente. So welcome everyone and let's get started uh, to our distinguished panelists. Welcome. Today we are joined by Lidia Cam Camarillo, president of the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project. Welcome, Lidia. We're also joined by Nina Perales, Vice President of Litigation at the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Welcome, Nina. And Michael Lee, the Senior Counsel uh, for Democracy at the Brennan Center. Welcome, Michael. Um, it is a pleasure to join you today and to serve as your moderator. Um, and to kick us off, I'd like to open up with um, just an opening statement, right? In the last two years, um, we've seen the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on the Latino community across social and economic indicators. Um, but that if we also want to make sure um, that Latinos have equal access and fair representation, that the process for redistricting is one of those tools to achieve that. And I wanted to kick us off with Lydia, if that's okay, um, and um, ask, the Southwest Voter Education Registration Project has been working on redistricting for years now. In fact, the Texas Latino Redistricting Task Force was created back in 2010. Lydia, can you talk to us a little bit about why this group was created its relevance and importance, and what led to all the amazing organizations deciding to collaborate and work together um, to center redistricting in our communities. Thank you for this kind invitation to share and talk to you about our experiences in Texas. Let me start by reminding us, I think all of us know this, especially those of us on, uh, right now on the panel, my distinguished colleagues and guests and, and my comadre and lawyer Nina Perales uh, for several of our cases, but certainly the redistricting cases. Uh, <clears throat> Texas has a long, long, long history of racial discrimination 
with intent to dilute the vote and violate the voting rights and violate our, the US Constitution. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, in December of 2020, although some of us think it was the uh, later, but it was December of 2020, we organized a meeting with Maldiv, LULAC, Malk, and other groups uh, in the Austin uh, Four Seasons Hotel to begin to discuss our concerns and our issues. We knew and we understood, given the long history of discrimination that Texas had, that the fight was going to be a fight to protect the seats that we had gained, Latino majority seats, and, and gain new seats given the potential growth. At that time, we knew there was going to be a growth of anywhere from three to four congressional new seats. And in fact, Texas got the lottery, the most congressional seats increased given the population growth, 4.3 million more people. Given, given the population growth, 90% or better was uh, Latino, Black, Asian, and other communities of color. Uh, and yet, uh, Texas decided to uh, retrogress two seats and dilute uh, our community. And then we basically understood that we needed to organize. Let me start by saying that the organizing part uh, was based on a couple of principles principles that varied in and were very important to us in the last session and in this session. We understood we had to fight to maintain our gains, Latino majority seats and districts, increase the number of Latino majority districts given the population growth, support the gains made by African-American and Asian communities, and respect the opportunities for uh, influential districts for all the communities. And that's how we proceeded. Uh, we organized first in Dallas, in Harris County, El Paso, the Valley, and in San Antonio, ultimately meeting regularly at the state capitol in one of the site buildings where we strategized, uh, reviewed maps, found uh, leaders who were willing to testify and work with us and become part of the coalition, and when necessary, uh, find uh, pairs of communities from communities of interest like that folks leaders in Dallas and in Fort Worth to create Congressional District 33. We knew then that the fight was going to be a long fight and Ina can tell you more that litigation to some extent is still gone going on because we're still at the getting now the legal fees that Maldives needs to retain after a victory of gaining two new seats. So it's a long haul. The same group again met this time, despite the pandemic, uh, we knew we had to meet and we weren't necessarily meeting in person, but we were all partners and we've have all been working in Texas to figure out both uh, groups that work, that do what I do, mobilizing Latinos and groups that care about the immigrant community. And we brought everybody together and we began to have the same conversation uh, making sure that communities would organize. We organized Latino-led organizations with the intent of the values that I discussed. There are some similarities between the 2021 and the 2022. One, there were Latino organizations we organized, we provided testimony, we organized, we agreed to protect uh, our interest and, and work on the growth of what we had gained. This time we gained two seats. Uh, the population growth was similar. Last time was 4.3 million. This time was 3.9 million. But the Latino growth was is 49% of that growth this time. So for us, it was important that we continue to have the same values. How do we sustain uh, the growth? So for example, when uh, the coalition presented a map, first to the task force, Mal uh, Malta prepared it, <clears throat> Nina and her team, we knew that we not only were going to gain a new seat, that 33 was going to become, uh, it, which is in Dallas and Fort Worth, was going to become a solid Latino seat. Mm -hmm. And we also protected Sheila, Jackson Lee, and Green uh, to make sure that, that the African-Americans, which at that time, they were paired against each other. That's not how it worked out. But we were looking at all the various interests. The difference is, this cycle, is that we're, we organized in the pandemic, we do not have the ability to protect ourselves anymore with Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. 
In 2011, we sued for congressional and state house maps. This cycle, we sued for all four maps, the, the congressional, the state senate, the state house, and the board of educations. And uh, I can tell you that in the last cycle, we were able to stop the maps from taking effect before the elections until we can sort of fix it. And I say sort of because at the end of the day, they ended up staying the same. But the maps that, that were given to us were so flawed, but the United States Supreme Court asked that given that map that the Texas legislature has drawn, let's fix it. Uh, we were able to do some of that and, retro, and the 23rd, which was retrogress was fixed as best as we could fix it given the map that was drawn. And what did they do? They pulled out performing uh, voting Latino precincts with non-performing Latino precincts, and that's how they traversed it. At its onset, it looks like it was perfect. Latino population was at the level that we wanted to see it, but when you begin to do the testing and all of that, we realized it was a negative. That, I think, is what uh, made the opportunity for us, but it's shocking when you think about it this way. We gained two seats in 20. Um, we gained four seats out of the four seats, congressional new four seats, Latinos gained two Latino majority seats. As a result of that, when we started in this cycle, we were at eight solid Latino majority seats. Estoy usando la mano para expresarme bien. And they took away two, CD uh, 23rd and 15. 15 is the valley up, I call it around San Antonio, Guadalupe. And then the uh, the twenty third, which is from San Austin, from, perdón, from San Antonio to El Paso, they retrogressed it. So we go from eight to six, and we were able to demonstrate we could sustain those seats at eight and gain three more seats. So para mí, we have the Latino community has been robbed, and I'm using that word politically, has been robbed of five Latino majority seats. Punto, at the congressional level, but that happened also at the state Senate level to two potential seats that we were able to demonstrate at the state house level and then the state board of education. So the fight continues. Couple that with, we filed a lawsuit with SB1 because we have the most ridiculous voter suppression bill on top of everything we've had in the past, voter ID, everything else. And so it's a constant reminder to us in Texas that Texas is the model state to to, for Texans to want the legislature to try to dilute the vote. But I can tell you it's more importantly a model state where Latinos come together, they organize, y no se dejan. Gracias. Gracias, Lydia, right? So that, that rich and robust historical context, right? Um, and when we talk about the importance of redistricting, but also that the, the, the barriers, linguistic barriers um, that our people, our community may have, right? Organizing and education is one of, you know, one and two um, of those, you know, aspects that, that must be centered and integrated in, in, in Latinos, right? Understanding what this is um, and what's at stake for us. Um, and so that brings me to, um, you know, welcome Nina, um, because litigation is a huge other um, leverage, um, you know, arm. Um, and tool um, in this fight, um, because as Lydia just said, right, you know, we've been robbed. And when we get um, a little bit more into, you know, what gerrymandering is for our audience, um, I wanted to ask you, Nina, um, the Texas Latino Redistricting Task Force, which MALDA and ESPER um, are a part of, filed a lawsuit in federal court challenging the state's new redistricting maps on the basis that it violated section two of the Voter Rights Act. Can you discuss with us how the coalition worked together to present this case and their evidence of racial discrimination um, uh, in the court, as well as has there been a difference between how you approach things in 2010 versus in 2020? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's really an honor to be a part of this panel today, uh, especially with such distinguished fellow panelists, Lydia Camarillo and Michael Lee. So I have a few slides to set the context, if it's possible to show them now. And uh, I'd like to move to the first slide, uh, or we'll call it the second slide, slide number two. 
if we could get there. Uh, okay, yes, this is uh, actually slide number three. Can we go back one? Okay, let's let's stick with that one. Um, this is the population change from 2000 to 2010. And I like to use these bars as a very simple chart, but it does show you how the population had changed in Texas from 2000 to 2010. And you're asking, that's not this past decade. Why is she looking at 2000 to 2010? Because I'm gonna show you the next one as well. But I wanna show you how the trend has been going. And also one of the reasons that the Texas Latino Redistricting Task Force did come together. Uh, Lydia told you the story of how the task force first came together. And she was describing this meeting, which was actually in, uh, in very early 2011, just as these numbers were coming out. This was the last round of redistricting that the Texas Latino Redistricting Task Force came together. Uh, in February of 2011. And these numbers were just coming out and we could see how significant the growth in the Latino community was. And we could see that this was gonna have profound implications for the drawing of political lines in Texas. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Now, the next slide is this decade. And we can see again, that the Latino growth is very significant compared to other racial groups, particularly non-Hispanic white group, which in Texas we call Anglo, uh, and in other parts of the country, uh, you know, there are different names for the non-Hispanic white group, but statewide non-Hispanic white population grew by less than 200,000, less than 200,000 new growth over 10 years compared to almost 2 million growth in the Latino community. And, and this is even reflecting what many believe was a significant undercount of the Latino community in Texas. So these are the numbers that still show dramatic growth despite this undercount. So when Lydia talks about the Texas legislature responding to this growth by enacting redistricting plans that are not fairly reflecting the growth, right? So she talked about how the Latino task force came together in the last cycle of redistricting and litigated and how we came together again in this cycle because this need persists. So if we could go to the next slide, this is just a very quick summary of some of the problems with the new redistricting plans that were enacted by the Texas legislature in the fall of 2021. And, the, and one of the big problems is the failure to create new Latino electoral opportunities in these redistricting plans where the Latino community is large enough and substantial enough politically to have drawn those districts. So, when Lydia says we're being robbed of districts, you know, she's pointing to, for example, in Houston, where there could have been a new Latino congressional district, but was not, where there could have been a new Latino state house district, but there wasn't, where there could have been a new district for the state board of education, but none was drawn. Same thing in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, failure to draw a congressional district. And then finally, in other parts of Texas, where we see failure to draw a new district that the Latino community really through its numbers is demanding. In the next slide, you will also see uh, that there were existing Latino opportunity districts that the state modified to make them weaker, to make it less likely that Latinos are going to be able to elect their candidate of choice. So it was a double headed strategy. One was to not create new Latino districts where there should have been. And the other part of the strategy was to weaken existing Latino districts by reducing the Latino population or otherwise manipulating these lines. So in, in the last slide that I have for you that's substantive for people who uh, yearn to see maps, uh, this is a map of the Houston area. On the left, you will see the plan that the state 
enacted. Now, you're, you may be wondering why it looks uh, you know, why these districts look the way the, they do. And this is in part because some of these districts are black opportunity districts, and there is one Latino opportunity district that's number 29, which is green. The state could have drawn another Latino district here for Congress in Houston, but did not. And you will see on the left, District 38 is uh, only 13% Latino registered voters. So if you keep your eye on 38, which is green, and you keep your eye on 29, which is green, and you go over to our, our map on the right, you will see there is also a 29 and a 38. Those are both Latino majority districts. Those are both districts in which Latinos have the opportunity to elect their candidate of choice. So the difference between these two maps is the difference between one congressional district for Latino opportunity and two congressional districts for Latino opportunity while at the same time preserving the Black Opportunity Districts 18 and nine, right? So respecting and preserving the opportunities of our brothers and sisters, but also drawing maps that fairly reflect Latino population growth. So we can end the slides here. And I just wanted to, to add a, a little bit of, of detail about what we're doing in the, in the current lawsuit. I will say that because the Texas Latino Redistricting Task Force already existed for the 2011 cycle. It was very easy for us to come together and make plans for what we were going to do for 2021. Lydia was the chair of the task force and still is, right? So Lydia calls together the state's Latino organizations because we have already been working and meeting on these issues throughout the entire preceding decade. And this gave us an opportunity to start meeting before the census data came down, right? Uh, and so before the census data comes down, before the Texas legislature starts meeting, we begin, right, to organize, to come together, to understand kind of what our general goals are. And then as soon as the legislature starts, we do three things. We, we get very active in the legislative process. For the Latino community, we create brochures that analyze the redistricting plans. Hey, this is what's going on at the Capitol. These plans are coming out and we don't think they're particularly fair. And we're gonna show you all these places. This way we can equip people from the community to come if they wanna to come to the Capitol, which was very challenging during the pandemic. But if they wanted to come to the Capitol and talk about what was not fair, we had brochures. We also, as the task force testified in legislative hearings, talk to them about their obligations to comply with the Voting Rights Act. And then finally, we proposed some plans and put them out there for legislators to see that this is what we thought was more fair for the Latino community. And then when the legislature enacted plans that we thought were not fair, we were able to file a lawsuit. And, and that's kind of where we are right now is we are in this new lawsuit challenging the redistricting plans. Others have also filed suit. We are not the only ones, but uh, we do have our case, which is focused on obtaining maps that are fair and fairly reflect the Latino community's political strength. Gracias, Nina. Thank you for that, right? You know, so, so again, back to the education component, the organizing, right? The, the litigation arm, um, you know, um, and then across all of those connecting, right, we're minimizing um, the language barrier and ensuring that our people get um, the education, the information, right, to debunk misinformation, um, the opportunity to, to actually visually um, see these maps, um, you know, what is and what could be um, is, is, is such a, a, an amazing tool um, to empower um, Latinos around redistricting. And so, Michael, this brings me to you. Welcome, Michael. Um, my question um, for you is, is uh, the Texas legislature drew a map that eliminated five districts that were competitive in favor of increasing the number of partisan voters in all congressional districts. At least that is the main takeaway if you read through um, some of the media coverage um, that's out there. But in our discussion uh, prior to this panel today, um, Michael, you mentioned that you are more concerned about the racial gerrymandering, gerrymandering going on 
what are some of the effects that this will have on representation and competitiveness? But I think it would be super helpful to, um, could we start with um, defining, um, establishing that common language for our audience around what gerrymandering is, racial gerrymandering, and then you know do that deeper dive? Sure, so um, in a state like Texas, um, you know, like there's always a racial aspect to redistricting, you know, and sometimes that's for, because people discriminate against racial and ethnic minorities, you know, Texas has long struggled to fairly treat its black and Latino communities, in particular, it's fast growing Latino communities. That's a five decade long story. It was the case when Democrats controlled redistricting in Texas. It's now the case when Republicans control redistricting in Texas. So like, this is a long story. Like, you know, Texas has like become Texas is long becoming more diverse and like Texas has always struggled to create room at the table for for everyone um and because Texas is so diverse and because there is so much you know polarized voting along racial lines you know both in the primary and and also in the general election you know like there there is an opera you know like oftentimes you know even very political moves um you know fall very hard along racial lines. And, and you know, the, the reality is in a state like Texas right now, um, Democrats only get about 25 to 28% of the white voter, the Anglo vote in Texas. And so, and, you know, the problem is that if, you know, so that's not a lot of white Democrats, right? You know, and then um, the problem with white Democrats is they also tend to like live very close to like white Republicans in the same neighborhoods and sometimes in the same houses. And so it's like very hard to sort of like slice and dice white Democrats in a way that sort of creates like a political advantage. Um, it's much easier because of continued res residential segregation to like break apart or pack together Latino communities, black communities, Asian communities in a way that sort of creates a political disadvantage. You see that play out in, you know, like all of Texas's maps, um, you know, and there will be litigation over, you know, the state will clearly claim that a lot of this was political, as opposed to being racially discriminatory. That's a little bit of an artificial bite or the Supreme Court has created where it's either race or it's politics, it's though not some kind of fusion of both that sort of like there's some kind of resentment of like people coming up and the fact that these people coming up would have political power, you know, sort of, um, you know, bothers a lot of people. But, you know, I think that that, you know, like, you know, the reality is, you know, like for all the bravado that you hear in Texas about, um, things like, you know, from Republicans, you know, we're going to win back the suburbs, we're going to start winning over more and more Latino voters. Uh, Governor Abbott just said something this week uh, about that, you know, like they certainly, that they may believe that at one level, but they also didn't draw maps like they thought that was going to be the case, right? Instead, they tried to diminish the, you know, the political power of, you know, of the suburbs of Latino voters, you know, across the board, like, you know, it was as though when it came time to draw maps, Republicans took a look at the in the mirror and saw the future of Texas and were kind of scared of it, right? And so, um, and, and that resulted in some, you know, like, you know, they, they, as you said at the outset of the question, you know, they, they drew some very ultra safe districts, you know, from a political standpoint, I'll give you one example, parts of um, Denton County, Denton County, north of Dallas historically has been in one congressional district, um, um, they drew parts of Denton County into a district that stretches all the way to the Texas Panhandle, more than 500 miles away to the New Mexico border, right? You know, and that's because they're scared of these suburbs that are becoming rapidly more diverse, right? You know, like I think the important thing to understand uh, for a lot of listeners is that most people of color in the country's metro areas, including in Texas uh, increasingly, now live in the suburbs, not in the cities, right? You know, the, People of color are moving to the suburbs, and the, you know that diversity, along with the sort of political shifts, has created a lot of volatility. So a lot of the big battles were in the suburbs, um, but then you know there also is like very rapid, you know, Latino population growth, particularly in the Dallas Fort Worth area, where I you know I believe like there are more Latinos in the Dallas Fort Worth area than there are the entire Latinos in the entire state of Colorado, and yet there is no Latino congressional district, there is no Latino state senate district, and you know so you see, you know that you know like this play out. Um, you know, and, and across the board, right, you know, like, you know, in fact, it's ironic that the one district, you know, like, you know, Republicans the cycle, they did do some good things for Democrats. If you're a Democrat, they did create a Democratic district in Austin. You know, Austin historically had been split among six different congressional districts. Um, that turned out to be almost a dummy mander for, for Republicans because, like, Austin is so Democratic, it is growing so fast that, you know, every district that touched Austin at the end of the day ended up being competitive. And so this cycle, they decided we're going to create a district in Austin um, just to put every Democrat we can find in the area in that 
Austin-based district. Um, but that's a district that is 64% white. So white Democrats in Texas get a district, but they fail to create any new Latino opportunities in, in, um, you know, in, in the Dallas Fort Worth area in Houston. And likewise, in the suburbs, they dismantle some districts that had increasingly become competitive, you know, particularly in Fort Bend County, where you know, multiracial coalitions are coming together and almost electing candidates, like just barely failing to elect candidates. Um, and, and you know, instead, what they do is they split up those communities and backfill them with rural white voters, right? You know, rural white voters really sort of are the key to key to a lot of this as though, you know, they're trying to, you know, if, if there's one story that gets told over the last couple of decades, it's really that, you know, the map drawers are trying to stave off demographic change like they're they're trying to like this this tidal wave of demographic change coming and rather than embrace it rather than say oh we're going to start competing for the votes of latinos we're going to start competing for the votes of black voters and we're going to start competing vote for the votes of asian voters they they decided to sort of really gerrymander their way out of it and, and to put their thumb on the scale in a way that sort of artificially determines what the results are wow thank you for that michael um Lydia, I, I, I want to come back to you, right? Um, <clears throat> redistricting is something that is not top of mind for many. Mm -hmm. um, yet it's an issue um, that will impact our community um, for, the you know, for the next decade. Um, your organization has been um, you know, a true leader right, in Texas, not only challenging the government uh, when they draw these unfair maps, uh, but also involving community members um, in actions, in organizing, right? Where the rubber meets the road. What are some of the best ways that we can start um, involving uh, community members, um, integrating um, this work uh, uh, to prepare for 2030 um, and that redistricting cycle? And, 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 and how can we help increase the power of the Texas Latino Redistricting Task Force? Well, I think a couple of points to make. First and foremost, just a reminder that the population of Texas, 39.8% is white and 39.4% is Latino. And with the undercount in any day, we're going to surpass that number. We are now the majority. The undercount didn't let us demonstrate that during this, the redistricting process, but I can guarantee you that we are the majority. Second, I failed to mention <clears throat> the names of the groups I was about to cough, so I thought I cut it short, but before I start coughing, my, my apologies, I've had a cough after I had COVID. Um, so it's, it's uh, in the LULAC versus Abbott, which is uh, uh, our current uh, case, uh, 10 groups filed the lawsuit, but it is a group of about 45 to 50 groups. Some are more formal than others, but they come across the communities. And at the end of the day, the 10 groups decided to file a lawsuit with Maldiv being our, our, our attorney and representing us once again, from not only my organizations, which are two, South Dakota and the Williams C. Velasquez, and LULAC, which as you know, the, the lawsuit is, is named after, after or, or named with them using uh, LULAC versus Abbott. But we have uh, the GI Forum, MABA, Hope, Mi Familia Vota, Fiel, Houston, and Texas Association for Latino Administrators and Superintendents. The, the similar, amount, the groups were eight the last cycle that organized, but I think the, to your point about what can we do, I think there's three things we can do. We can continue to educate the community because in the next cycle, we're gonna go through this again, unless, unless, uh, we elect more Latinos who will fight to make sure that we sustain the majority Latino seats that Latino just serve, uh, which is what you begin to see in states like California before it moved to a commission. Uh, and then now, now I think we also have to uh, make sure that we continue to register to vote. We don't have the luxury this cycle in 2020 to blocking, stopping the uh, maps that in our, from our perspective, we're missing five Latino majority seats just in the congressional uh, because of uh, uh, the Shelby ruling, the United States uh, Shelby ruling. So I think we need to organize, we need to register, we need to turn out to vote. You fight uh, the violation of our voting rights by showing up and voting and expanding the electorate. Texas is the second largest state 
with the second largest number of Latino voters. Uh, and we will continue to be the largest state. Uh, for example, we expect that this cycle, uh, 1.5 million Latinos will cast their vote in the general elections compared to 850,000 African-Americans. And so we're gonna continue to see the growth, but there is a fight. There is, a, there is an organized effort to stop Latinos from taking uh, their, their uh, space in America's democracy uh, where we can decide our own destiny. And so uh, or nonprofits and business leaders and elected officials have to come together. Uh, I, may, I may say that the elected officials that are Latino are also in the same place we are, except they filed their own lawsuit, much like what they did last time through Malk. But we're gonna continue to fight for the Latino community. The difference between our lawsuit and other lawsuits, uh, and Nina can uh, verify this, I believe, is that our intent is to increase and support the representation of Latinos. And it's not about uh, parties, it's about representation and allowing Latinos to elect their candidates of choice. That was our goal then, it is our goal now. And in 2030, we also have to be more prepared, on like, much like what we used to do when we first started doing this at Southwest Water, we're 48 years old, Maltes is 52 years old, is we would actually also train people to learn how to do their own maps at the local level. We need to do more of that. There was very little resources and time to do that this time. And I think we're gonna lose many opportunities at the local level, which are just as important as the state level is. So thank you. Oh, if I may, just there was a question about performing uh, precincts and not performing precincts. If I may just answer one of those questions, Please. Nina will do a better job. But it basically means that we have precincts where Latinos live there, but they may not be registered and they're not turning out to vote compared to precincts where they have, there's a long history of Chicanada, Latinos that are turning out to vote. I say Chicanada because we're in Texas. Uh, uh, if, if, and if we're talking about CD23, where we were referring to, if I was talking about Houston, I'd have to change it because there's actually more Salvadoreños in Houston than there are Mexicanos in Ladero. Anyway. No, but you and, know, thank you and for the, And Puerto Ricanos in, 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 in Kink, in, uh, in uh, oh, I forgot the name of the place, the Fort, the Fort Place, perdón. Sí, no, no, tranquila, right? Because that just speaks to, right, uh, back to Michael, your point, right? This, this, this rich diversity, right? Um, and as Latinos, right, that, you know, again, it's, it's not this monolith, right? And, and so depending on, you know, where in the state and, you know, um, you know that rich diversity and, and, and the other thing that you honed in on, um, Lydia, was, right? Um, that this isn't um, partisan, right? That for us, this is about the empowerment, um, you know, and the progreso Latino uh, of Latinos in Texas, you know, all across our communities. Um, but I'm going to come back to you now, Nina, right? Um, and ask, right? We have seen the impact that the Texas Latino Redistrict Redistricting Task Force has had. Uh, but with so many things happening in our world right now, right? Um, and everything that Latino families, um, communities, right, are navigating. Why is it important for us to continue this conversation when the census is eight years away and that the next redistricting process starts in 10 years? Thank you. I think that we need to keep the conversation going because it's a conversation about Latino political potential and Latino political engagement. That is a conversation we should always keep in mind. Redistricting is part of that. It's about whether district lines will fairly represent our presence in, in the electorate, right? And, and I think it's, so important to keep the conversation going about Latino political potential, because too often the conversation, whether it's in the media or whether it's by elected officials, is about Democrat versus Republican, right? Too often when we're trying to talk about Latino voting rights, a reporter will ask us, what does this mean for Democrats? What does this mean for for Republicans and Michael does such a nice job of distinguishing those things, right? When whenever we do a panel, I can always count on Michael to to draw that distinction, right? And for and and what Lydia says as well, this is about Latinos 
making their own decisions and choosing who they want to elect. And we say, we want that, that opportunity to be there. Latinos want to elect somebody who is purple, who is green with spots. You know, that is, that is not the question. Is, is it somebody in a blue t-shirt or somebody in a red t-shirt? We can't have all of the complexity and, and the importance of the discussion around our political participation be reduced to this contest between blue t-shirts and red t-shirts. We think it, it, you know, that it's reductive. And it also takes away the agency from the Latino community when instead somebody says, well, that's, that's not really important. What's really important is how many D or R people are getting elected. So finally, I think it's important to keep up the discussion about redistricting because we have to press Congress to enact legislation to restore parts of the Voting Rights Act that have been lost to us through judicial decisions and other, other things. The, the Voting Rights Act is weaker now than it was 10 years ago. And, and as we can see through these controversies all over the United States, voting discrimination is alive and well. And we need to keep the pressure up on Congress to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, so the Brennan Center has been at the forefront of informing and educating the public about the impact of redistricting. And the importance of getting involved and paying attention to the maps that have been drawn, what are some of the resources that are available for the public to use? Um, as well as how many or how can community-based organizations use this information to help increase awareness and participation. And back to what Nina so eloquently said, right? Um, using the, the, the nonprofit sector, the, the community-based organization um, you know, body um, to build and sustain, right? Um, the Latino political engagement. Well, that's a that's a great question. And of course, it's a challenging thing as anybody who's trying to organize people around for district aid knows because you know it's very abstract right when you talk about like laws that make it harder to vote you know you you automatically have like some 95 year old grandmother or great grandmother who sort of can't vote and has always voted and has a really great story and so there's like a a face right a human face to sort of what is happening and how the laws work and that sort of makes it easier for people to understand and for people to get outraged if you talk about laws that prohibit you from giving water to somebody standing in line in a hot long line people understand like that's stupid right you know that's discriminatory and like it's bad redistricting kind of you know you don't see the lines when you drive around town right and it can be kind of really hard for people to get engaged and they also I think, you know, in a state like Texas, and I, I used to live in Texas, I mean, you know, a lot of people are very cynical about it, like there's nothing we could do, right? You know, like, how could we possibly influence this very amorphous process that we don't understand? Um, and, you know, so it can be really hard. The good news, I think, is that in some ways, it is becoming easier, right? There are increasing tools that are available, you know, like, it's very easy now to, there are more public mapping tools that are available people can get together in their own communities and start drawing maps and things like that like here's what i would like and you know it's, it, you know not some of them you might have to say like well that would be unconstitutional for this for that reason or or by late law but you know like it's a good starting place and like you know you can have these sort of conversations and around the country i think you know some some really great things in the, you know, like in new york city there's a unity mapping coalition that kind of came together like very different groups latino groups asian groups black groups um you know all kinds of groups came together and kind of created you know, okay, this is how we would sort of, you know, draw the districts of New York. And that's a, a very helpful conversation that gets people kind of engaged. And, and you know, you can also, you can easily show with maps, like, you know, like how communities are split apart much easier than you could before. Like, you know, and, and again, going to New York, um, you know, a really powerful visualization was that the Asian community in Queens, uh, one of New York's boroughs is split among five different districts. And you could see like, here's the Asian community. Everybody agrees like this is our community, right? And then it's like split up and it's like, wait, why is it split up? And it's like, because it's meant to dilute our power, right? And and so, the, you know, the tools are, are getting better. Um, and, you know, it's, it's easier to sort of do. And I think that there's more funding that's available. And I think, um, you know, the media is doing a slightly better job of not telling just the D's versus R's story, although they still tell the D's versus R story, that's sort of their default. But, you know, I do think like, you know, um, you know, a lot of newsrooms have gotten more 
customers and people have sort of put out, you know, like things like, like, like here's like how the Latino community in Dallas is actually split and why, why is it split this way? It's like, there's no good reason for it. Right. And so, you know, I, uh, you know, I do think, you know, there are, you know, resources that are, you know, you know, lots of community groups are starting to acquire this, you know, there are lots of like good government groups there are lots of, you know, groups that represent black and Latino and, and other communities that sort of have access to this, but it is important to have that conversation because, um, you know, like, you know, you, you have to keep people engaged on this. It's not, it's a very abstract topic. Um, the good news is I think that it is increasingly becoming possible to do that, um, but it's hard work. No, thanks for that. It, you know, as I as I heard you um, speak just now, Michael, right? Um, you know, so the federation, right? We 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 launched a redistricting academy, um, and in as many states as we can bring there, right? And we did that in English and Spanish. And um, you know, I'm a first generation Latina, right? And so um, I was I was one of the videos um, in Spanish, and I kept, yeah, you know, even in the language that we use to expose, right, and educate um, our people, right? I kept thinking. Um, how would my mom get this, right? If I was thinking that my mom is who I'm educating around the redistricting process, right? What language, what words, um, you know, what visuals, how do I engage in this conversation, right? With my mom, my grandmother, um, and, and, and that's, that's, that's so critical, right? Um, because, you know, some of this, you know, seems so far away, but when you see it, when there are maps or when you learn how to draw a map, right? Um, you know, that there is, there is this, this, this understanding, this aha moment, I think, for our people when, when you're able then to connect those dots. Um, and I think that that's so critical for the sustainability of the work. Um, and, and, and the civic engagement and the empowerment, right, or the commitment to do this work. Yeah. Um, but we have um, a really active chat. Um, and so I-, I, I if can, can I just say one thing? I mean, yeah. I do think to, to Lydia's um, point, like I do think a lot of like a great place to start a lot of times is sort of in local redistricting, right? Because like people understand like their, their own communities, their neighborhoods, right? You know, like it's hard for me to understand like whether a map is fair in San Antonio or not, because I've never lived in San Antonio. I have some kind of general sense because I do this work, but I don't really, and you know, like what is fair in Corpus Christi, like, you know, it's it's like really hard to tell, but like, you know, we talk about your own neighborhood, like, you know, the example I gave of Queens for the New York City Council, right? You're like, uh, people understand that like, like this is like, we've defined our community. We understand exactly where our community is. And it's like, you know, like in what is happening and, and like, you know, and also the, you know, you know, the people that you kind of sometimes turn to more often, like you know, how, how often do you call a member of Congress, right? But, you know, like you might have something, of, you know, called the city councilor about the potholes or, you know, the, the loose dogs or whatever the case may be all the time, right? And so I think people understand that a little bit more. And that's like a great gateway into engaging people. So if you're doing this work, like, you know, don't, you know, all the attention is on Congress, right? Because everybody cares about who controls Congress, blah, 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 right? But, you know, like the local stuff is actually not only meatier, but I think easier for people to grasp. Yeah. Um, Lydia and Nina, any 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 other thoughts? Um, because I, before we go there, there are about two other questions in the chat. Oh, some more. Um, and I just wanted to uh, provide you both the opportunity. Um, um, to I just any... I just want to remind us again. And my apologies with my cough. I'm not being consistent. I'm trying to stop this. I think I'm about to cough, but. <clears throat> I, I think we have to think of redistricting. And I think that at, at least as we went around talking to community leaders, because we talked to not just the organizations that joined, but their networks. Some of them are formal organizational membership organizations. Other are, are not, and it's their network. When we speak to them about the importance of representation and political power, uh, and that they have, they have the right to determine determine their own destiny by electing their candidates of choice. And then we talk about the resources that they're losing, mm -hmm. that the resources are very, very important. We lost a lot of money thanks to the undercount, but we also are losing a lot of money when we don't have representation of those folks who care about our own interest. And so those are the things that our community understands. Saying the redistricting in Spanish, I never say it right. I mm -hmm. eventually, I eventually move on to dibujar or reconstruir, but at the end of the day, people get it that it's about when you basically, even if you do it manually or when you do it with a piece of paper, that you say, this is how big we are. And then we're gonna get this little piece, this little piece, but we could have this whole piece, let's fight for it. 
they get it. And so I think for us, that's very important. I think the second point is Nina is right. I, uh, I think that every, from now until we get it done, we need to reauthorize the John, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to protect ourselves. And so it has consequences both in Texas and other states. And I think that once the Congress decides to do its job, and we know that it passed in Congress, but not in the Senate side, uh, and, and, and fixes section four, we're gonna find that there's far more jurisdictions than the ones we originally had where this, there's this discrimination that is you know, living and growing and festering in a way that we're not going to allow it. So to the question about, do we continue to organize? Yes. If you don't know what to do, send money to Maldives, send money to, to Southwest voters, to Federation, to the Brennan, whoever you choose to but get involved in one way or another because todo cuesta hasta el agua. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Lydia. Nina, so any, any last thoughts before we jump into some questions in the chat? I will, I will just say something very quick. And I think Michael and Lydia have heard me say this a hundred times. I'm gonna quote my favorite political scientist, Cardi B who, when she was talking about the census, but it is also true for redistricting, it's about money, power, and respect. And I think that that is a message uh, that is very, um, it's very easily understood by everybody, Latinos and others. It's about money, power, and respect. Wow, thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to repeat Julie's question just to ensure, right, that, um, you know, we cover all the ones that are in the chat. So Julie Beer, thank you for being with us. And she asked, can the, tex can, can the Texas Latinos overcome this gerrymandering by voting strongly? I can take a stab at that. Uh, yes and no. Even if we go out and we vote, if we're registered, if you know Lydia's organization, Southwest Voter, gets you registered, gets you turned out, you're there, you're in the polling place, you're casting your ballot. When redistricting plans are drawn in a way that is unfair, even when you go and vote, your vote is diluted, right? Which is changing the basic rules of the game. When a state gerrymanders like this, to reduce Latino political opportunity. They're changing the underlying rules so that even if we play just as well as somebody else in the state, the rules have been altered to make our vote less effective. And, and thus we have to fight bad redistricting plans in two ways. We have to attack the redistricting plans and try to get them overturned. And at the same time, mobilize and vote so that we can overcome these bad lines at some point. Thank you. So um, we also have, um, and I'll kick this one over to Michael. Um, Jay Cortez, thank you. Can we get more visual aid on how they do it so that we can see it better to understand? Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, in some some states, you know, the, the gerrymandering is really subtle, right? You know, like North Carolina, they drew a, a map that like, if you looked at it, looks pretty good, except that, you know, it, it creates like a really, you know, it, it, it eliminates black opportunity, it creates a skew heavily in favor of Republicans. And so there's some places where, you know, you can't judge a district by its shape because the nice shaped districts actually are bad. Um, Texas is a little bit different. I mean, you know, like, I think if you sort of like, you know, and Nina's group has like, you know, many examples of this where, you know, like you really see that the splits are along racial lines, right? You know, like they, they really are drawing people like, you know, if a neighborhood is heavily Latino, it goes in or out of the district, depending on whether it's, you know, advantageous to the goal or not. Um, and, you know, like in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the Latino community is split of multiple congressional districts. If you just sort of looked at like where Latinos live in Dallas and Tarrant counties, like, and then you see like what congressional districts are in, like that is, um, you know, really quite compelling. And, you know, groups like, you know, the, the Texas Tribune, I think has done a good job of sort of like showing like some of the splits, you know, particularly, 
the changes that were made to the with the the thirty third congressional district, you know, a big group of Latinos are taken out and put in to this district. It's almost like a seahorse, right? It kind of comes up and chomps up a bunch of Latinos, and then it comes down south of Dallas and, and Tarrant County and includes a bunch of rural, mostly white counties. And it, it's like they don't have many Latinos or many people of color at all. That you're wondering, like, hmm, I wonder what's up with that, right? I mean, you know, so there, you know, there are better visuals that are, are there. And I think that that's, you know, a, a big part of telling the this, this story, right? You know, it goes like, you know, no, you know, there's not really sort of a rationale that sort of makes sense for having a seahorse come up from rural Texas and chomp up like urban people. Like sometimes, you know, like their choices that you make and you can, people can disagree about the choices that, you know, like keeping one community together over another community. But, you know, like that has, there's no justification for it. And so the good news is that like when I give presentations around the country and I use PowerPoints, like the, the examples are always like Texas, right? <laughs> because they're like, it, like those are the ones that really kind of get get people like this, you know, it's it, Texas is a hard state to like, you know, like gerrymander in some ways, right? You know, you have to really be aggressive, you know, create these weird districts because it's changing so fast, right? You know, it's like, de you know, like every every decade, it's like 4 million people, 4 million people. And, and and you know the state is just getting more and more diverse and like the diversity is not going to stop right you know and so like it's it's like actually a really hard state so you have to be pretty aggressive at doing it um and so that's why the, the examples in texas are so out, outrageous you know like it's much easier to do in, in other places so thank you um we also have a question um thank you paco garcia so the question is san antonio is the only diversity is 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 it because this can never wait so san antonio is the only diverse city is because this can never happen to our community is this because this can never happen to our community do we still have voting rights um well i you know i i, I certainly think like lots of places in texas are like very diverse you know like i, I do think like other places are you know, like, you know, I, I think like the, the increased diversity, for example, in Houston, like Houston is now the most diverse city in the country, yeah. like, you know, and, and, and Fort Bend County outside of Houston to the West is a very, very diverse, you know, multiracial, like, like that people may, who are old enough may remember Tom DeLay, um, you know, was the house, uh, you know, like, you know, was the number two Republican in the U.S. House. He's from Sugar Lane, Texas, which is now 40 percent, 40, almost 41 percent Asian. Right. You know, and it's so so and, and you know, like you, all those areas have gotten really more diverse. And like, you know, like Texas is like really and, and the, some of the statistics Lydia mentioned. Right. You know, like Texas, like very few states are as diverse as Texas. Right. You know, they're like I think Texas is the maybe the fourth most diverse state, you know, if you count and that includes Hawaii. Right. You know, which is like, you know, almost an exception. Right. And, you know, and so, you know, like Texas is well ahead of the demographic curves, I think. Um, you know, San Antonio might be a little bit different because it's so heavily Latino. I, I believe it's probably the most Latino of the big cities. Um, and, you know, the other areas are a little bit more, have gotten more diverse recently. And so, you know, that's sort of like a challenge to people's exist the status quo. You know, you're talking about, you know, potentially electing very different kinds of people um, from the people who held power before. And so that's why some of the battles are taking place in like Houston and in the suburbs of Houston and Dallas and the suburbs of Dallas. So. I would say uh, in terms of the question, do we have voting rights? We always have our voting rights, no matter the demographics of the city that we live in or the state that we live in. We always have our voting rights. The issues may play out differently in a Latino majority city like San Antonio, uh, but we always do have our voting rights. Gracias, Nina. Um, and so uh, we're about three minutes. Oh, time flies when we're <laughs> sharing knowledge and educating us. Um, I want to thank you, Nina, Lydia, and Michael for your leadership, your time, and educating us today. Um, to our audience, if we didn't get to your question, we'll ensure um, that we share with all of our um, content experts here on the panel um, to get um, an answer back to you. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Um, it is a critical conversation um, for us all everywhere, and in particular in the state of Texas. Um, again, you know, civically engage, 
get out and vote. Um, donate, as Lydia so eloquently said, because um, uh, the sustainability of this work um, will require each and every single one of us. Um, and there's no shortcut, and this is long-term work uh, together. So thank you so very much to our panelists and to all of our audience today. Um, and uh, until next time. Gracias. <laughs>